the whole turkey. Gone? <laughs> well, Scooby we go. Scooby-Doo and his groovy pals in Mystery Inc. are the fan favourite creations of Hanna-Barbera, debuting on the CBS Saturday Morning Cartoon Block in 1969. Having appeared in 15 different television series, 34 straight-to-home media animated films, 4 live action films and much, much more, the Scooby-Doo series has become one of the most beloved cartoon franchises of all time, having remained on television screens continuously for 50 years. The original Scooby series Scooby Doo Where Are You was, according to Kevin Sandler, author of an upcoming book on the history of the series, a strategic move in response to cultural shifts and, as published by CNN, a reaction to the political turmoil at the time, eventually becoming a light-hearted series that would grow and adapt over the decades. In 2019, Scooby Doo and the gang turned 50 years old, and to celebrate I will trace their entire evolution right from 1969 to now. To do so, we will look at the most important changes in the character design and personality, and in the stylistic and narrative structures prevalent across five decades of series and films, in this very special edition of Cartoon Evolution. <laughs> The late 1960s were an incredibly turbulent time for America. The Vietnam War was continually raging, serial killers were on the loose, and high-profile assassinations, including President John F. Kennedy, Senator Robert F. Kennedy, and civil rights activists Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were all too regular. These events caused civil unrest throughout the decade and spawned seemingly never-ending protests and long, violent riots across the country. President Lyndon B. Johnson even appointed a national commission on the causes and prevention of violence, causing what has been referred to as a moral panic. During this period, American audiences were gripped by the idea of good versus evil, not only because of the wars raging on their own shores and abroad, but because of the ongoing space race, which saw the US adamant to be the first to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Television networks urged producers to go stronger with their content, leading to an incursion of programs focusing on space adventures, spies and world domination. Also inspired by the nation's recent fascination with James Bond and its continuing captivation with superheroes. New York Times columnist Sam Blum wrote at the time, the more horror, the higher the ratings. Joseph Barbera, one half of the animation producing team Hanna-Barbera, who were the pioneers at the forefront of television animation, would call these kinds of programs out of this world action. This change in the entertainment landscape saw Hanna-Barbera turn their back on the kinds of slave slapstick comedy that they had flourished with for the best part of three decades, with short series featuring the likes of Tom and Jerry, Huckleberry Hound and Quick Draw McGraw, and television series such as The Flintstones, The Jetsons and Yogi Bear. In their place, they would produce the likes of Johnny Quest, Space Ghost, The Space Cadets, Birdman and the Galaxy Trio, The Herculoids and Marvel's Fantastic Four for children's Saturday morning television. Despite feeling victimised by the change, Barbera noted that they relented to stay in business, finding these kinds of programs to be the only thing they could sell to networks. With television having rapidly grown as the entertainment vehicle of choice for audiences, campaigners, likely swept up in the moral panic, found it an easy target, putting the medium under fire for its low censorship regulations. Most notably, children's programming was disdained for its commercialism, lack of diversity and, of course, violence, seeming to be desensitising audiences and inciting the violence in the real world. The National Association for Better Broadcasting would even declare 1968's roster of children's programming the worst in the history of TV. This influx of programming saw the rise of various lobby groups, with Action for Children's Television, or ACT, at the forefront, vehemently fighting against unregulated influences on children's TV. Hanna-Barbera's Action Adventure series were amongst the most disparaged, with lobbyists pointing to their incessant overblown violence. As the leaders in television animation at the time, Hanna-Barbera took no half measures, and if the networks wanted studios to go stronger, you better believe they went the strongest. <laughs> 
After much lobbying and protest from ACT and other parental groups, the networks buckled under pressure and began cancelling all programs that were target of such scorn. In fact, by the beginning of 1968, the majority of Hanna-Barbera's targeted programs were taken off the air. This left network heads scrambling for new ideas to rejuvenate their Saturday morning cartoon lineup with lighter, fluffier, friendly affair. None more so than Fred Silverman, the executive of daytime programming at CBS, whose previous lineup had included Hanna-Barbera's Space Ghost and Herculoids. Silverman felt that without his popular animated programs, there was an enormous hole in the schedule. Silverman's first acquisition for his new block was The Archie Show, based on the Archie comics by Bob Montana and produced by Hanna-Barbera's main rival, Filmation. The series followed Archie and his friends from Riverdale and placed them in a bubblegum pop group. It was designed as a musical comedy with fictional band The Archies performing songs every episode. The Archie show debuted in September of 1968 and was instantly successful. The music on the show oozed its way into popular culture as well with the song Sugar Sugar becoming the most successful Billboard number one hit of 1969. With one success under his belt, Silverman looked towards developing another. He would note, I had always thought that Kids in a Haunted House would be a big hit. Riding on the popularity of Archie and inspired by the highly popular 1940s I Love a Mystery radio serials, focusing on a group of friends roaming the world on adventures, solving supernatural mysteries, Silverman came upon a premise that would follow a teenage band who between gigs would brave haunted houses and come face to face with ghosts, ghouls and monsters in supernatural mystery adventures. Also inspired by Universal's classic Abbott and Costello monster mash films of his childhood, such as Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, he felt there would be great potential to make it an animated comedy, but with serious stakes. Silverman Silverman would tentatively title his idea House of Mystery and requested the Hanna-Barbera team to develop it as a series. Barbera and co-producer William Hanna agreed to take on the series and began developmental work. They assigned story development to storymen Joe Ruby and Ken Spears who had worked on Space Ghost and Herculoids and character design to Iwao Takamoto who had worked on all of Hanna-Barbera's major hits. The team established a crew of five characters, heavily stylized off those from the Archies. Their names were Kelly, Jeff, WW, Linda and Mike. The former four were the basis of the characters who would later become, respectively, Daphne, Fred, Shaggy and Velma. While Daphne and Fred's predecessors bear striking similarities to their later designs, Shaggy and Velma's are practically unrecognisable. A bongo playing dog named Too Much was also added to the roster as a supporting character and band member. It is said that it was Barbera's idea to add a pet character to enliven the show, just as they had on many of their other series. In fact, Muttley from Wacky Races would co-star in series Dastardly and Muttley, which additionally formed part of CBS's new Saturday morning roster. Takamoto suggested that Too Much could be a large clumsy dog that he could get some comedy out of, and Ruby and Spears envisioned him as a Great Dane. However, scared that similarities would be drawn between the character and Marmaduke, a popular comic strip character of the time, he was changed to a large sheepdog. Silverman, though, was unimpressed with this idea, likely because changing him to a sheepdog would now draw similarities to the Archie's pup, Hot Dog. He was thus changed back to a Great Dane. In designing the character, Takamoto spoke with a studio colleague who was a breeder of Great Danes in order to get a good grasp on the ideal characteristics of a prize winning dog. Taking all he'd learned, Takamoto decided for comedic effect to turn everything on its head. Takamoto would note, I selected about five things. For instance, a good, strong, straight back, so I sloped his back. A strong chin, so I underswung his chin. And straight hind legs, so I bowed them. With the redesign of the dog, the rest of the team also got a second pass. The fifth member of the team, Mike, was dropped from the roster while the others were rechristened and completely redesigned. These would mostly be the finalised designs, though minor discrepancies can be noticed. Fred's hair is much darker, Velma wears a necklace and no glasses, and the dog's coat features no spots. While the Archies formed the inspiration for the team's original designs, characters from the popular late 50s, early 60s television series The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis would inform 
perform their redesign. Fred, named after Silverman himself, would be based on lead character Dobie. Velma would take inspiration from Zelda, Daphne would be loosely informed by Thalia, and Shaggy would take not only his looks, but his hippie personality and like speech style man from Mina G. Krebs. The team, their band, and the series as a whole were named The Mysteries Five, likely a tongue-in-cheek reference to the popular Famous Five book series by Enid Blyton about a group of four adventurous young friends and their dog travelling around England and uncovering hidden mysteries. The production team, which consisted of many animators and story artists from the old Tom and Jerry shorts, put together concept art and Silverman set off to pitch the series to the president of CBS in New York, including the head honcho Frank Stanton. One last minute revision however saw Silverman rename the series Who's S -S Scared? Silverman would say, I was convinced this was going to be the biggest hit we ever had. But despite this, Stanton shot the idea down saying, we can't put that on air, it's just too frightening for kids. Despite the mild comedic aspect, the fact that the series had an overly serious tone sabotaged its prospect to be Saturday Morning Cornerstone and became the first rejected pitch that Silverman had ever made for the network. At a loss for what to do, Silverman spent his entire red-eye flight back to California listening to music and brainstorming a way to make the series work. Just as the flight was coming in to land, Silverman apparently heard the final refrain of Frank Sinatra's Strangers in the Night. Ultimately, this inspired the name Scooby-Doo, which he gave to the dog. Seemingly coincidentally, the Archies had released a song the earlier year titled Feeling So Good, Scooby-Doo. According to multiple reports from those who were there, this had no bearing or influence on the dog's name whatsoever, but it seems like quite a big coincidence to me. Now with a name for the dog, Silverman would note, it's at this point where I said, yep, we'll take the dog, we'll move him up the front and it'll be the dog show. And returning to his original inspiration from Universal's comedic monster films realised that Scooby and Shaggy could be the show's very own Abbott and Costello, turning it into an all-out comedy while retaining serious threats. Silverman would note that it only took the team two hours to reformat the show using all their original story ideas but with a simple refocus. Characters were once again slightly modified and given a softer edge, finally taking on the form that we all know and love today. The band element of course was removed completely with the team now taking on the moniker Mystery Inc. Likewise, the series was retitled Scooby-Doo Where Are You? Silverman repitched the series to the CBS executives and production was approved. Scooby-Doo Where Are You debuted on CBS's Saturday morning block in mid-September of 1969 and was an instant hit, scoring a 55% share of the audience on the first episode, rising to 65% for the majority of the season. This was a huge score for CBS and Hanna-Barbera, who ran the show opposite Filmation's own mystery series, The Hardy Boys. The series would use Silverman's original premise of teens solving mysteries in haunted houses and place it in a simple comedic formula, where every episode the paranormal threats and high stakes would feel real but ultimately be uncovered as elaborate hoaxes set up by small time crims in costume. They would be unmasked and deliver a variant on the classic line. And it would have been mine if it hadn't been for those meddling kids. Again, this is similar to Blyton's Famous Five where many supernatural mysteries were revealed to be ruses by story's end. The characters were each given recognisable personality traits which fed into the show's comedic nature. Fred was positioned as the brain a strong-willed leader of the group who often gets in over his head, Velma, the intelligent and analytical one, Daphne, the danger-prone damsel in distress, often finding herself kidnapped by the episode's villain, and Scooby and Shaggy, the cowardly ones, more interested in finding their next meal than solving the mysteries. While Scooby wasn't usually presented as an anthropomorphic animal in the early series, he was essentially a funny animal character with the ability to speak broken English. The series also made use of limited animation techniques in an effort to keep down budget and make episode production faster. This included characters with little detail, especially noticeable on faces, and the use of held cells, still characters, cycled movement, recycled animation, and fewer frames per second, resulting in a slightly jilted movement. While limited animation is often disdained for its cheap look, it was heavily utilised for Saturday morning cartoons and actually gave Scooby-Doo especially a suitable and 
recognisable aesthetic. The series ran between 1969 and 1970 across two seasons for a total of 25 episodes, and its popularity would spawn a plethora of similar teenage mystery series, many of which were produced by Hanna-Barbera themselves. In 1972, CBS would reformat the series as the new Scooby-Doo movies. While the character designs and the show's basic formula were kept the same, the episodes were lengthened from half an hour to an hour and aimed to offer more sophisticated plots and characters for the kids who grew up with the original series, even though they were only three years older by this point. The roster of the team remained the same as well, however each episode would see them joined by a celebrity guest star, in most cases lending their voices to the animated version of themselves. Guest stars on the series included the likes of Dick Van Dyke, Don Knotts, Sonny and Cher, and Mama Cass Elliot. Additionally, a few fictional characters appeared on the show, including Batman and Robin and the Addams Family, while some deceased guest stars were voiced by imitators, including the Three Stooges and Laurel and Hardy. The show ran for 25 episodes, coming to an end in 1973. In 1976, new Scooby-Doo cartoons would once again hit the small screen, but this time on the ABC network, where Silverman was now working as president alongside Ruby and Spears as supervisors of the Saturday morning lineup. The series underwent various title changes between its 1976 and 1978 run, including Scooby-Doo Dino Mutt Hour, Scooby's All-Star Laugh Olympics, and Scooby's All-Stars, depending on the cartoon block it was placed in and the cartoons it was played alongside. The umbrella title for these episodes however was The Scooby-Doo Show, the title it would retain when the cartoons were screened individually in reruns and in syndication. Some of these episodes were even later repurposed in 1978 as a de facto third season of Scooby-Doo Where Are You? The cartoons returned to their original half hour format and retained the classic haunted house hoax mystery formula. The characters all retained their original designs while a new character was added to the roster, Scooby's cousin scooby Dum. In in 1979, ABC would screen Scooby-Doo's very first primetime special, Scooby Goes Hollywood, a fairly meta 50 minute production which saw Scooby and Shaggy attempting to convince network executives to move their low class Saturday morning show into primetime, much to the behest of Fred, Daphne and Velma. The show would spoof the traditional Scooby-Doo formula in traditional self-deprecating Hanna-Barbera style and parody many popular movies and series of the time, including Superman the Movie, the Sound of Music, Happy Days, Saturday Night Fever, and Charlie's Angels. While the characters once again retained their original designs and certain limited techniques would still be used, the animation was notably better, with smoother movement and more refined detailed drawings. The special is also notable for being the first in which Scooby was presented in a more anthropomorphic design, occasionally walking, running, and even dancing on two legs, a trait which would become fairly regular in following series. By the this time, Hanna-Barbera, the ABC and audiences were finding the Scooby stories had become highly repetitive, as was evidenced in their inability to come up with many original ideas and the consistently falling ratings numbers on the network, partly the reason behind the Hollywood special. In order to rejuvenate the series and keep it fresh, Barbera had an idea to incorporate a new character, Scooby's nephew Scrappy-Doo, practically a miniature version of him based in part on the appearance and personality of the Looney Tunes Henry Hawk. Scrappy added a feisty, energetic element to the show, with the character always full of confidence and looking for a fight, the complete antithesis of his uncle Scoob playing for great contrasting comedy. Barbera is quoted as having said, if this doesn't work, Scooby's dead. Knowing full well that the network was looking to cancel the series if they couldn't find a successful new angle. The addition of Scrappy was just enough to keep the series original, and ABC ordered 16 half hour episodes of Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo. The series took on the classic Scooby formula, but put a larger focus on Scooby, Shaggy, and now Scrappy, with Fred, Daphne, and Velma all put somewhat into the background. Finding large success, Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo was reordered for more episodes, commonly known as the Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo shorts, as they aired in 33 half-hour 
hour episodes, each containing three seven minute short tales. The first 20 episodes ran between 1980 and 1981 as part of the Richie Rich Scooby Doo Show Saturday morning block, while the remaining 13 aired between 1981 and 1982 as part of the Scooby Doo and Scrappy Doo Puppy Hour. This time round, however, the series was completely overhauled to focus more heavily on Scrappy and his adventures with Scooby and Shaggy. In doing so, Fred, Daphne, and Velma were dumped from the lineup. The later 13 episodes, in fact, each contained two Scrappy, Scooby, and Shaggy shorts and one Scrappy and Yabadoo short, following the adventures of Scrappy and his Western deputy uncle, the brother of Scooby Doo. One other major divergence of the Scooby and Scrappy shorts was the existence of real monsters and creatures within their world, with the tired hoax formula finally being ditched altogether. Following in 1983 was the new Scooby Doo and Scrappy Doo show, later renamed the new Scooby Doo Mysteries for its second season in 1984. The series encompassed a total of 26 episodes, many featuring two 11 minute shorts with the occasional featuring one full length, for a total of 44 new stories. The series added Daphne back into the lineup after three years and saw the team investigating supernatural mysteries under the guise of teen magazine reporters. While some episodes featured real monsters like in the previous series, others made a return to the classic hoax formula. Fred and Velma also appeared in guest roles together or individually across six episodes of the second season. Following directly after was 1985's The 13 Ghosts of Scooby Doo, which once again starred Scooby, Shaggy, Scrappy and Daphne with new characters added to the team. While the designs of the legacy characters remained the same, Shaggy and Daphne would have a slight mix up in clothing, which now more represented the modern 80s fashion. Shaggy would wear a red t-shirt and blue jeans instead of green and red respectively, while Daphne would wear either a jumpsuit or a dress and belt with an occasional puffer vest, all kept within her traditional purple and pink colour scheme. She was even given white eyeballs for the first time, having previously been coloured the same tone as her skin. 13 Ghosts was the first Scooby series to feature an overarching story, with the team attempting to locate and return 13 ghosts to a magic chest from which they escaped. As a result, it exclusively returned to featuring real ghosts and ghouls. Unfortunately, 13 Ghosts was not a major success and was cancelled before production finished on the final episode, with the team failing to return the final ghost to the chest. The storyline would however find a resolution and closure 34 years later in 2019 straight to home video feature Scooby Doo and the Curse of the 13th Ghost which mimicked the show's thematic and visual style and even returned Fred and Velma to the cast. With the TV series having faltered, the only appearance of Scooby and the gang throughout the late 1980s was through a series of made-for-TV movies. These were presented as part of Hanna-Barbera's Superstars 10 series, which starred popular characters and aired during the fantastic world of Hanna-Barbera block. The movies returned to the formula of the earlier Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo series, following the adventures of Scooby, Scrappy and Shaggy in his 13 Ghost design. These featured real monsters, however the Boo Brothers film included a hoax reveal. Scooby and the gang returned in 1988 for a pup named Scooby Doo, a brand new radically re-envisioned series in the babification style. A 1980s 90s fad which presented popular characters in youthful designs, also seeing Hanna-Barbera produce such series as The Flintstones Kids and Tom and Jerry Kids. Here the characters were presented as elementary aged children in their classic costume design and were drawn in a highly stylized art design, all given large wide eyeballs and rounded heads. The show as a whole would spoof the tropes and conventions of the earlier series, taking on a mystery solving supernatural hoax formula, but using wackier, more self-deprecating humour, often inspired by the zany works of Tex Avery and Robert Clampett on the early Looney Tunes cartoons. The series was quite popular and lasted 4 seasons and 24 episodes between 1988 and 1991. Scooby and Shaggy once again appeared in their mature form in 1994 made for TV movie Scooby Doo in Arabian Nights, where they would act as narrators, book ending short tales starring Yogi Bear and Boo Boo and Magilla Gorilla, inspired by the Book of 1001 Nights. The film used bright, colourful and stylized animation, giving the characters a flatter, more angular and cheaper appearance. Shaggy reverted to his classic costume design and was given white eyeballs. 
1998, Scooby-Doo would move from ABC to Cartoon Network, who celebrated with a 25 hours of Doom marathon of the entire Where Are You series. In between episodes, the gang featured in a series of eight new 60 second mockumentary style shorts, appearing in their original retro designs with limited animation style. Likewise, in 2001, the team appeared in Night of the Living Do, their first extended Cartoon Network production. The 20 minute special was designed as a tongue in cheek revival of the new Scooby Doo movies and co starred a handful of celebrity guests such as Gary Coleman, David Cross, and Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. In 2002, the first live action Scooby Doo movie was released to cinemas. The film was directed by Raja Gosnell, written by James Gunn, and executive produced by Hannah and Barbera. It would, however, be Hannah's final production role on a piece of Scooby Media before he passed away in 2001. The movie presented the characters in their original iterations, with slightly modernised yet still vintage takes on their costume design, with the film being set in modern day. Freddie Prince Jr. starred as Fred, Sarah Michelle Gellar as Daphne, Linda Cardellini as Velma, Matthew Lillard as Shaggy, and featured a CGI Scooby. The movie took on the Where Are You mystery formula, complete with hoax reveal, and the characters were presented with their classic traits. Daphne, however, was made more independent and more self-reliant with efficient martial arts defence skills, traits which would become more prevalent in most following Scooby media. The film was a box office success and Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed, a sequel starring the same cast using the same formula, was released in 2004. Unlike the first, this one received a poor box office reception and a third entry in the series was cancelled. A number of straight-to-home media live-action films have been released since, however, 2009's The Mystery Begins, 2010's Curse of the Lake Monster, and 2018's Daphne and Velma. The films all act as prequels to either the original live-action films or the cartoon series, but strangely became more modernised and high-tech as they went along, appealing to a more modern audience. The first two would share the same cast of live-action actors, while Scooby would appear in an outrageously low-budget CGI form. Daphne and Velma, however, starred two different actresses as the titular characters and marked the first Scooby-Doo entry not to feature Scooby-Doo in any capacity, with Fred and Shaggy even being left out of the cast. 2002's What's New Scooby-Doo was the first major revamp of the original series for decades, however would be a highly modernised version of it with the team relying on 21st century technology. It ran until 2006 for three seasons and 42 episodes and was the first series to be produced by Warner Brothers Animation following its acquisition of Hanna-Barbera. Character designs mimic those of the original but with more polish and detail, especially in movement and facial features. The team retained their classic era clothing design, except for Fred who trades his shirt, sweater and ascot for a simple striped polo. 2006's Shaggy and Scooby-Doo Get a Clue followed, and is the only recent adaptation to sway majorly from the classic formula, instead taking more cues from the Scooby and Scrappy-Doo era. It saw Shaggy and Scooby off on globe-trotting adventures, solving real monster mysteries with an inheritance from Shaggy's missing rich uncle, while Fred, Daphne and Velma are usually out of action. The series presented perhaps the most stylized versions of the characters to date, in an almost heightened, more angular, more modern version of their vintage designs, shown in the characters' black dot eyes and lack of detail. They were also presented in modern clothing, with Shaggy trading his trademark green or red t-shirt for a white and green striped one. It ran until 2008 for two seasons and 26 episodes, and was the final series to be executive produced by Barbera, who passed away in 2006. After a two year absence, Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated followed between 2010 and 2013 for two seasons and 52 episodes. It was once again a modern take on the Where Are You series and its formula, even presenting the characters in their vintage designs and clothing with a slightly modern angular twist. The series returned to the idea of a continual plot arc, however featured a more plot driven narrative than any previous series, including proper character development and romantic 
romantic dramas. While continuing to be outlandish story-wise, it also took an incredibly dark and serious tone, inspired by classic horror and thriller films, with stakes and frights feeling more real than ever before. I imagine this series is more in line with, and perhaps inspired by, Silverman and Hanna-Barbera's original Who's So, so Scared treatment. Be Cool Scooby-Doo followed between 2015 and 2018 for two seasons and 52 episodes, with the last handful to be the first Scooby Media to debut on Boomerang. The series eradicated the dark and serious tone of the previous incarnation and instead returned to the wacky hijinks of Where Are You with an even zanier modern edge. The series' style and design was highly stylized in the same vein as the rebooted Tom and Jerry show and new Looney Tunes, which all debuted around the same time. Characters appeared in classic costume variations with a design style similar to modern animation such as Adventure Time or Rick and Morty. Beginning in 2019, Scooby-Doo and Guess Who is the most recent incarnation of the series, airing on both Cartoon Network and the Boomerang streaming service. The series takes on the classic hoax formula and works as a reboot of the new Scooby-Doo movies, seeing celebrities assisting the team on larger, more epic adventures. So far, our guest stars have included the likes of Ricky Gervais, Sia, Batman and Wonder Woman. The series once again takes on a more traditionally inspired character and animation style, utilising cleaner and sleeker flash animation. Of course, over the years, Scooby and the gang have appeared in a total of 37 straight-to-home media or television movies, with another announced for 2020. These usually land annually or biannually, and have so since 1998's Scooby-Doo on Zombie. Island. The series has seen Mystery Inc. come head to head with the usual ghosts, zombies, witches, mummies, goblins and demons and even the Loch Ness Monster, Samurais, Pirates, Robots, Aliens and Dinosaurs. A large majority of these films take on the classic Scooby hoax formula while about a third of them present real monsters and supernatural entities. The movies are well known for offering continually more baffling adventures and science fiction storylines not often seen in the series. Some have even taken the form of musicals. The movies also offer the occasional crossover with classic characters such as Batman and more bizarre celebrities such as rock band Kiss, the WWE and celebrity chef Bobby Flay. Most installments present the characters in traditional animation, some in the classic vintage style and others in the same style as their then concurrent TV series. However, it is worth noting the two Scooby-Doo Lego movies featuring all of the characters characters in Lego form, similar to the Lego and action figure based web shorts from 2015 and 2016, as well as Scooby-Doo Adventures The Mystery Map, which presents the team as puppets designed off their a pup named Scooby-Doo appearances. Additionally, Scooby and the gang have appeared in a current total of 20 platform based video games. While most of them have seen the gang appear in their traditional style, some offering us our first glimpses of said designs in CG form, it is worth worth noting 2009's First Frights and 2010's Spooky Swamp for offering unique young teen iterations of the characters. In 2020, Scooby and the gang will hit the big screen once again in their very first CG animated installment, Scoob, the first film in a proposed big screen Hanna-Barbera cinematic universe. While some test footage and cast images have been leaked, this is the only piece of officially released art so far. The film will star Zac Efron as Fred, Amanda Seyfried as Daphne, Gina Rodriguez as Velma, Will Forte as Shaggy, and longtime Scooby voice artist Frank Welker as Scooby. Scoob. The film will present characters in their classic attire, retaining the charm of the original, while giving them a contemporary animated edge, bringing them full speed into the next generation. 50 years on, Scooby and the gang continue to bring the action, adventure, mystery, frights and of course laughs. Going stronger than ever before, Mystery Inc. show no signs of stopping. And at that, it's over to you, Scooby-Doo. I want to know what is your favourite Scooby-Doo iteration so far from the vast five-decade history? Vintage? Modern? Something in between? Fire away in the comments below and let me know your thoughts. If this is your first time viewing one of my videos and you'd like to see more like it in the future, then please don't forget to hit that big old subscribe button up on your screen, as well as that like button down below for that little extra support. Also, don't forget to check me out on social media, and please consider supporting me over on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and have a fantastic day.